Hello and good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, my name is Kara Oosterhaus and I'm the Western Canadian Field Editor at Real Agriculture and I'm pleased to host today's webinar for the Simpson Centre for Agriculture and Food Policy and Public Education at the School of Public Policy. First off, thank you for joining us. I am very much looking forward to our session today. We got some very interesting topics and I hope you guys, we will have a Q&A session following the presentation. So I hope you guys join in, ask any questions that you would like to ask and we'll be sure to get them answered from you. So we've got a very interesting topic today. I'd like, I'd like to welcome Robert Falconer, a research associate at the School of Public Policy. Robert's going to discuss the role of temporary foreign workers in Canadian agriculture. And as always, like I said, we will have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Robert, I'll let you jump in from here. Thank you very much, Kara. Um, as Kara said, I'm a research associate here at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, uh, specializing in immigration and refugee policy uh, and research. Um, previously working a lot on refugee resettlement, uh, reform of Canada's asylum system, but with COVID-19 have shifted focus to uh, looking at issues specific to immigrants in this area. Um, previously published on the role of medical professionals, immigrant medical professionals in, in, uh, in Canada, but most recently has be, have begun focusing on immigrant uh, workers in, in agriculture. A focus of today's topic is going to be on temporary foreign workers in Canadian agriculture. Um, both primarily temporary foreign workers, those who are here on a temporary work permit, but also uh, we will touch on, of course, uh, undocumented workers, people who are here who are out of status workers in Canada. Um, this has raised, COVID-19 has raised a number of questions in this area in regards to the health and safety of workers on farms and in, in processing plants. It has also raised questions about their, their permanency in Canada um, when they come back year after year. Uh, it also raised questions over the employment of Canadians and, and why producers could not employ more Canadians during a time of historically high unemployment uh, among Canadian citizens and Canadian permanent residents. We'll try to cover these uh, very quickly today. We're going to go into the current trends in this area, but also maybe a bit of the historical background into how we got here. And then afterwards, as Kara mentioned, we'll open it up for, for question and answer. Can okay, I go in here and I'll start by sharing my screen. So, foreign workers in Canadian agriculture and food processing. Um, I want to actually, I'm going to start off actually by sharing a picture from uh, my early 20s. This is during my, my undergrad career, where during the summers, I would often return home to my uh, home province of British Columbia to actually work in agriculture, helping to uh, work with temporary foreign workers, mostly from Mexico, in, in cherry packing. So, this is actually something that I had a personal experience in doing. Uh, I speak Spanish and, and it was an opportunity for me to work with, uh, with awesome, wonderful individuals coming up from Mexico who were uh, very capable workers and uh, glad that I can kind of go back to those roots there. Uh, there are currently about three programs that, that manage agricultural uh, immigration to Canada. Uh, there are there's a seasonal agricultural worker program, then there are uh, the agricultural stream for temporary foreign workers, and then there are other high wage and low wage streams. Uh, what you need to know about this one is that, for the most part, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program is primarily citizens of Mexico and, and the Caribbean. Uh, they are for six to eight months non-extendable permits. Now, when I say non-extendable, that means that the worker can't extend the same work permit, but they will, they'll probably be able to get another permit if they want to come back in the future. There are, not any, there are no options realistically for permanent residency for seasonal workers, and the, the work they have to do has to go on what's called the National Commodity List. In other streams, they can be from any country. Uh, they can go up to 24 months with the opportunity to extend those work permits. To, and there are uh, some options for permanent residency, mostly through the provincial nominee stream. Um, if you get into the high wage stream, agricultural streams or you're managing a farm, there might open up some other possibility under federal streams. But the bulk of, of foreign workers working in agriculture in Canada do come under the SAW program, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. As previously mentioned, if you look there on the left hand of the map, uh, most agricultural workers do come from Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. A smaller number come from uh, Asia and, and an even smaller number from Ukraine. 
Uh, again, the bulk of these do come from uh, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. As far as the sectors they are concentrated in, uh, again, most of them do come as general farm laborers um, or in some sort of supervisory aspect with regards to that. Uh, increasingly, though, there is a large number that are, are working in secondary food processing. These are the individuals who are in charge of refining, packaging, and helping ship the agricultural produce that Canada creates, uh, especially in other processing, also in, uh, in, fit, in seafood processing, with a smaller amount in meat packing. When you look across provinces, this varies widely. Ontario and Quebec use a significant number of, of farm laborers. Uh, out in the Atlantic Canada area, you have a significant number of temporary farm workers uh, working in fish and seafood processing. Of course, here in the prairies, uh, you, you do have uh, meat packing plants as well. The most the one that's been in the news a lot lately is the Cargill meat packing plant. Um, and, but, but then increasingly, so relatively speaking, the rat fastest growing area where temporary forkers are being employed in Canadian agriculture is secondary food processing. Now, the number of, of temporary forkers right now working in agriculture in Canada is about 72,000. That is a historically high number, but it's not only the number that are coming, but it's also the time of year in which they arrive. And this is where we get into a bit of the impacts of COVID-19. When we look at COVID-19, this, this shows historically the, over the past number of years, the arrival of temporary forms by month. As you can see, there's an early spike at the beginning of the year. This is associated with, of course, calving, with seeding uh, out east. It's associated with the onset of the Atlantic fishing season. Um, this year, as, as you may notice, the 2020 line, which is in red, it is below last year's number of 2019. Uh, numerically, this means about 4,600 fewer workers between January and June, or about a 12% a drop in comparison to last year. Now, that, that's quite a significant drop. That's quite a few uh, fewer workers on, on Canadian farms and in processing plants. Uh, it's also larger when you consider that a large number of producers were likely planning for expanded output this year. I mean, they, they made their, their capital plans, their, their budgets for seed and for facilities around hoping for an even higher number of farm workers this year. Um, so this has absolutely had an impact on the, the, number, the labor shortage issue in, in Canadian agricultural sector. In, in relative terms, uh, the largest impact has been in seafood processing, where about, they've experienced about a 60% decline in, in arriving workers this year compared to last year. Um, second, that is, is meat processing, which, which has experienced about a 20% decline, and then below that, uh, farm labor, but I will, I will say that farm labor has, is the largest in terms of absolute numbers. Now, how do we get here? We just raised a number of questions. Uh, so we see here that the agricultural sector has been impacted by the decline in arriving TFWs. Those TFWs who are here um, are, uh, are working under very different conditions and all have been uh, hugely impacted by COVID-19 on farms. Some farms are under lockdown. We've had a number of deaths on farms related to COVID-19. There have also been, uh, there's a huge issue of undocumented workers on these farms, workers who are otherwise out of status, they don't have a legal work permit in Canada, who may be afraid to get tested or get, uh, get health care related to COVID-19. Um, so that may raise questions, you know, why, how did TFWs come to be such a huge part of the Canadian agricultural system? Why don't we just employ more Canadians? Um, what steps can be taken to protect the lives of TFWs and also in secure the supply of labor uh, in so doing for Canadian agriculture. So we're going to go a little bit backtrack here a little bit and I'm going to give you a very, very quick history of the development of the temporary farm worker program uh, with regards to agriculture in Canada. This figure here shows the number of immigrants arriving in Canada since 1852. And then the two big one areas I want to point to is uh, that relate to agricultural immigration are the Dominion Lands Act of 1872 and also the start of the Ministry of Sir Clifford Sifton in 1896. The Dominion Lands Act famously opened up the West to significant levels of immigration, um, specific to farmers. And Sir Clifford Sifton was the interior minister of the time, um, short, uh, the period after that, who really drove home a recruitment of immigrants, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, to come to Canada. So a large number of especially Western Canadians who have Ukrainian, Hungarian, Mennonite background, very likely their ancestors came to Canada as farmer and immigrant farmers during this period. You can see, of course, a big spike in immigration leading up to the First World War, 
most of that is uh, immigration or is uh, immigrant immigration of farmers. Uh, and as we see during that time, the the huge increase in, in cultivated acres as well as farms during that period. Now, as you can see, approaching World War II, you do start to see a, a sort of a slacking off in terms of, of the number of farms being created, also the number of acres of farmland throughout Canada. And what you'll begin to see here is that following World War II, you see a sharp, sharp, sharp decline in the number of farms in Canada while the number of acres being farmed remains relatively static. What that means, what that essentially tells us, that's, that, that's farm consolidation. That is the transformation of the agriculture sector happening right there, where you see a, a, a shift from a large number of small farms to a smaller number of very increasingly large farms. Um, this figure right here shows that as farms shrunk, I mean, if you, on, if you, on the x-axis, the, the horizontal axis, as you shift less, as the number of farms have shrunk, the average area per farm has grown uh, very rapidly. Um, now, why, why is this important? Well, as we cover here next, this is the, the change in, uh, in workers on farms during that same period. I'm going to go back one slide and show you here. There, there are several different types of workers in agriculture. There are, of course, employers. These are, are producers, food processors, and farmers who employ people regularly on site, either on a seasonal basis or full-time basis, help them on the farm. There are own account fart workers. These are, are farmers who very rarely hire outside labor. There are unpaid family members. These are, are family members of farmers working uh, out in the field, helping to bring in crops process them, and then of course there are paid employees. These are paid workers from off the farm who come to help, uh, help with produce and, and processing. This right here shows the change in the domestic workforce in agriculture by class of workers since the 19, late 1940s. As you can see here, there has been a very sharp decline in the number of small farmers in Canada and also an associated decrease in the number of unpaid family members. And as I've been telling others in discussing this topic, when you buy out a farm, you don't get to keep the family that worked on that farm. So that means that you've either, you have to do a number of things. You either have to find uh, outside employees, outside workers, or you have to uh, increase your capital expenditures um, and, and invest in greater technological innovation. And, and as we'll show you here, both have happened. Uh, this shows the rise in, in monthly wages. These are real wages, meaning that they are adjusted for inflation. Farmers have tried to hire outside workers. They've, they've invested a lot in, in making uh, farming jobs look attractive to outside workers, but even so, the, the pool of domestic labor has declined during this period. They've also, it's also been a highly innovative sector. Uh, producers have, have invested heavily in, in new technologies. Um, this figure right here shows the investment of, of producers in, in capital expenditures as farm equipment. Um, I also just threw there, just for your sake, just one example of farm equipment, of course, is the tractor and, and just large investments in, in tractors per 1,000 acres has gone up considerably also during this, this consolidation period. Now, another option is, uh, is permanent immigration. Um, and, and actually, the Canadian government originally tried to do that after World War II. They, they tried to foster, uh, again, continue that Sitton era uh, immigration policy of bringing in workers as landed immigrants. The problem was that there was a, a major focus in only allowing European immigrants uh, to come during that period. This figure here shows that um, that even as farmers have tried to raise wages, real wages, um, the the pool in domestic labor has de has declined. Meaning that that farmers have struggled to source labor from from their local communities. They've struggled to find paid workers there. So hence you have the introduction, uh, when, as, as this gap has been created, as the number of farmers um, who working uh, and on small farms has declined, larger farmers have, have tried to look elsewhere, and of course this led to the creation of the temporary farm worker agricultural programs. Uh, the orange line shows the rise in TFWs during this time and, and the fall in, in landed immigrant workers. So we basically sub we've shifted from permanent agricultural immigration to temporary agricultural immigration. Now, unlike domestic workers, which are shown here in the, in the blue dots, uh, TFWs have responded very well to, to wages offered by, by producers. Producers, they've offered higher wages. An increasing number of TFWs have come year after year to take advantage of those wages and work in Canadian agriculture. Um, they've come to comprise one in two of the paid employees. Now, this is what you'll often, you'll sometimes hear data from Statistics Canada showing that 
um, temporary foreign workers are about one in one in five workers in Canadian agriculture, and that's certainly true. But when you take out uh, family members, employers, small farmers, et cetera, and you look at just paid employees, KFWs actually account for about one in two or about half of all paid employees in Canadian agriculture. They, they, that's the green line shown in this figure here. While domestic workers have remained within sort of a static 25 to 30% range of the total agricultural workforce since about the 1980s, even as uh, small farmers and unpaid family members have declined. So key takeaways, and we're going to wrap this up here in a second, but key takeaways is that government policy is unlikely to reverse the long-term labor trend in, in declining domestic participation in agriculture. Again, this is not just domestic paid employees and domestic small farmers. Um, we've seen this most recently when New Brunswick tried to shutter the doors in the TFW program. All that ended up happening was a, a very large decline in, in the, the labor um, availability of workers in, in agriculture uh, for, the, for the New Brunswick agricultural sector. And this actually makes sense in the context of the current pandemic. Uh, many employees are not necessarily looking for new jobs. They might be content to wait on the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit and hopefully return to their old jobs as the pandemic, as the economy begins to reopen. The number of arrival TWs has been significantly impacted by COVID-19. The agricultural sector itself has been impacted and will likely result in higher food prices. Um, we've already seen some of the higher average of food prices, particularly with regards to meat, poultry, fish, seafood, and of course, dairy products. Um, and that TFWs are a critical part of the sector. They complement innovation, they supplement the gaps left by families, and urgent policy responses are needed to protect their well being and the supply of workers. Wrapping up here, we provide some short term ideas for how to protect the lives of foreign workers. The big ones I want to highlight is the availability of EI sickness benefits. A worker who's not worried about losing a significant large amount of their wages um, will likely be more likely to take time off. Um, currently, they do not receive EI, and therefore, they might be more inclined to go back onto the on-site to work, even if they are feeling symptoms. Other ones is uh, enforcement of existing regulations and perhaps expanding the opportunity for other age outside agencies like the CFIA to, to go on uh, to farm, uh, to uh, on-site to, to producers to, to inspect current working conditions. Uh, there's also needs to be consideration for producers, um, support for housing. The BC model shares the cost of housing temporary foreign workers in hotels with the BC government. There might also be consideration for housing subsidies or, or tax deductions for creation of new housing, some of which has already taken place at the federal level. And then finally, also expanding agri-insurance for labor shortages, which is something that's been uh, piloted in Ontario. Maybe wish, we might wish to consider to see in other provinces, but also expanding agri-insurance for food processors, who many primary agricultures are setting along uh, their, their supply of food. Long term, though, we might want to consider a, a path to permanent residency for, for, lo for long term workers. Um, that might mean expanding the current agri food pilot program, create options for seasonal agricultural workers, perhaps fulfilling a, uh, an hour requirement. Um, this would provide a, 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 an additional incentive for workers to come in the future if they're scared of coming now due to COVID 19. And, and if producers are concerned about losing workers due to permanent residency, I want to emphasize here. That, that other pilots with regards to trucking, also the Maple Leaf Foods in Manitoba have shown that a, a high transition from residency has not affected at all the supply of, of temporary farm workers. And it just calls back to our, our long-term traditions of agricultural immigration to Canada. That, there are other points we could raise here, but I'm gonna open up for questions now. That's it for the main presentation, but happy to entertain questions at this time. Awesome. Thanks, Robert. That was a wonderful presentation. So we do have a couple questions coming in here. Um, the first one we are going to hit, it says, what does the data say about TFWs becoming permanent residents in the last 10 to 20 years? If they can apply for PR, is there any data on the same people coming back every year for 10 years or more? There is data on this, actually. Um, when we look at uh, other uh, when we look at the seasonal agricultural worker program specifically, only about one to two percent become permanent residents every single year. And I suspect that has very little to do with programs for, for seasonal workers themselves and more to do with, let's say, they meet a uh, Canadian resident spouse or partner and come through those means. Um, there are, through other agricultural streams, or for example, I use the example of trucking because there's a, a logistical component here with, that's related to agriculture. Uh, you can actually get up to about 80 to 96% of them become permanent residents. 
but that that represents a very very small part of the total sector. Most or, most workers come as seasonal workers, and very few of them become season, become uh, permanent residents over time. Now, when you look at repeat workers, um, within about a three year period, about half of them will still be coming back. So these are workers again. They come here after about three years. We still have about half of them. Um, up to 10 years, we still have to up to about 25 to 30 percent of workers are still coming back year after year after 10 years, 10 seasons, I should say, working in Canada. So, uh, in comparison to other uh, types of temporary farm workers, after 10 years, that drops down to the low single digits. Seasonal agricultural workers, we see a considerable number of stay year after year past uh, past one decade. Okay, and also, so if we don't embrace these temporary foreign workers and allow them to come to the country and stay, so as you said, lots of them don't actually immigrate over here, um, how do we get the GDP growth that is so easily there if we plan a new way for Canadian agriculture? So if I understand it correctly, correctly if there, there's, maybe the, if I understand the, correct, the question correctly, how do we get the, the GDP growth from, from workers if they aren't settling here permanently? And the, the reason is that they are, uh, in a lot of ways, permanently temporary would be the, the, the way I would phrase it. That a number of them, as we mentioned previously, do come back year after year after year. Um, some of them for just a, a short period, a month to a month and a half. Um, some of them come for a longer period, six to eight months. Um, but again, they could be coming back for up to 10 years. Uh, this is why one way we might want to thread the needle on, on um, selecting uh, potential permanent residents from these workers is the hour requirement. And the reason why I mentioned the hour requirement is that um, uh, you might not want to select a worker who's only here for going to be here for about a month, but let's say a worker is here for six to eight months and they've been here for 10 years, they've certainly by then fulfilled a, a, a significant number of hours working in Canada, more than even a lot of other temporary foreign work programs allow. Um, and, and certainly, again, they currently do provide a large boost to GDP growth from the fact that they, they come back year after year. Um, certainly, we could also look into the taxes of them and their families, um, where they immigrate permanently. They do, I should say they do pay taxes here in Canada, but there are, of course, uh, economic benefits that if they were to move here permanently. And what kind of support, uh, like government wage support, do TFWs get right now? So, like you talked about some of the things they could get, but currently right now, what do they get? Do they get maternity leave, any EI benefits? No, so that's the other area here. Uh, along with uh, employment insurance, uh, seasonal agricultural workers themselves especially cannot get um, paternity or maternity benefits. And this is why, again, provides a, a concern where a worker who's exhibiting symptoms might be concerned about losing wages for themselves. It, or let's say a family member back in Mexico gets sick. Um, there, there might be that incentive to go back on site, onto the work site, whether it's a food processing plant or the farm. Um, because they don't have that. Other TFW programs, they do have some forms of employment insurance. Um, they can get that. But again, I want to emphasize that here, when we talk about agricultural immigration to Canada, the vast majority of immigrants are represented in the seasonal worker programs. So the, 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 the wage supports for seasonal workers are very limited here in Canada. So moving more into uh, COVID-19 and what we faced this year with TFWs, um, what are your recommendations for reducing the spread of COVID-19 on farms through TFWs? That's a good question. Um, it, it, when we talk about, I'm going to talk about very short-term ones. I, I'll, I, I sound like a broken record, but I do think it is, I'll mention just briefly again, the, the wage subsidy piece. Uh, that's a government response, of course. Uh, that takes away the, the thing there. The other one I mentioned also during the presentation is the BC model. Uh, I think it'd be worthwhile for provinces to adopt that as well. And what that BC model does is that if a worker has to go into quarantine or self-isolation, the BC government will cover the support for let's say a hotel room and food services and other, other socio-cultural services during that time. And it, I think it takes a little bit of the weight off producers as well, because this will be a difficult year for producers. That'd be the other one. Um, other ones that we've seen from the ILO, the International Labor Organization, uh, other suggestions include creation of cohort groups on on uh, on sites, and a, a cohort group, for example, would be um, you might have if you can have certain workstations where a cluster of workers work together, but they also would not do that. They would also take their lunch time together, and they might if they live on site, they might take shower times together as well. And they might maintain their own food and cooking equipment, their own hygiene equipment, and in between um, them and other cohorts, there would be of course cleaning protocols put in place. 
course, PPE as well is a big concern on farms. Um, uh, but those are those are some of the big suggestions as well. Then, of course, housing. Um, this is maybe not a short-term one, but this is where, again, I think we go back to the it, it, somewhat of a quasi-BC model where we might want to consider uh, additional support so we can hopefully spread the number of workers around different housing sites, whether it is in housing at the work site or hotels, et cetera, with maybe some government support for, for putting them there. And do you have any oversight of how well or how consistently employers are currently following these regulations, like any of... When it comes to COVID-19, are, are, are these actually being implemented and are people actually being protected? It, it varies a lot. Um, and a, a significant uh, consideration is, of course, the number of uh, workers without status on farms. As in Southwest Ontario, for example, there's about 8,000 seasonal agricultural workers, about 2,000 workers without uh, documentation working in that area. Um, working without a work permit um, and, and producers in that area might be might show some level of disinclination towards enforcing public health regulations. I, I think there there is a financial incentive here, of course, and where where again I'm going to sound like a broken record here, going back to against that BC model. Um, that in BC, producers have shown much more inclination towards uh, following public health regulations because you know there's this pri public private partnership there that that helps back them up as well. Um, so it, it varies. Um, it also varies with inspections on site. Uh, this is why I suggest um, sort of employing multiple agencies with regards to inspection of, of public health regulations on site. Certainly health specific ministries are going to be the be better ones there but even if um, I use the Canada Food Inspection Agency as an example of, a, of an additional agency that's often on site anyways to look at food safety quality we might want to even do just a, a very broad level view of, of labor conditions on site as well and, and see how our how our producers enforcing public health regulations so with the ongoing shift to automation in manufacturing construction and service industries jobs for citizens with less skills disappear if citizens do not want to do the agricultural jobs, then there's a combination that the wages and benefits of the ag jobs are too low and the unemployment insurance and other social welfare benefits are too high. Um, this combination, do you see it as unsustainable and what, what kind of can we do about it? Sorry, I'm going to hopefully ask you to repeat the question. I cut out for just a very brief uh, second here on my end. No worries. Okay, so one more time. Um, the question is, with the ongoing shift to automation in manufacturing, construction, and service industries, jobs for citizens with less skills disappear. If citizens do not want to do the agricultural jobs, then there is a combination that the wages and benefits of the ag jobs are too low and the unemployment insurance and other social welfare benefits are too high. This combination between all of this going on um, is this unsustainable and what can we do to sort of, I guess, mitigate this? Well, the first thing I would address there is, is the wage piece. Um, certainly uh, they aren't, uh, jobs in agriculture aren't gonna be paid as well as for, let's say a job for like a bachelor, master's degree in, in, the, in the service sector or um, other industries as well. But uh, I'll, I'll go back to um, previous example of, of real wages over time that, that producers actually have been raising wages in real terms. And I, what, to clarify that term once again, real terms means in, above inflation. Um, so far, so in real terms, uh, the wages for, for uh, workers in agriculture have gone up to about $800 a month um, in late 1940s, and that's $800 in today's money uh, to, uh, I believe the number right now is, let me just pull this up here, uh, a little under $3,500 per month right now. Um, so, so wages have been going up. Uh, certainly though, when we uh, when we have to realize that the current uh, also welfare system right now, the response to COVID-19 has been, CERB was essentially paying people to stay home. So the idea that if you get laid off during the pandemic, um, we'll sustain you over until you can hopefully return to your old job. Um, uh, so we, 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 we are certainly paying people not to necessarily go enter the agricultural sector right now, but again, there, there, even before COVID-19, there was a large disinclination along the domestic workforce to enter into agricultural uh, sector as a, as a career, as an employee. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a trend that can, can be reversed, to be honest. Uh, I don't think Canadians are necessarily interested in, in working this job in huge numbers. And again, I want to emphasize here, it's not the big number here is the employees, it's actually small farmers. The, the, we often, we 
often mistakenly call it the labor gap associated with employees, but the labor gap here has actually been the one created by the exit of owners, small owners of farms, and their unpaid family members have left the industry. And as I said, when, when, when a big farm buys out a small farm, you do not get to keep the previous owner and their family to keep working there. So you have to find outside labor. Canadians will do that labor to a certain extent, um, and they, they have, but it will not fill the gap com completely left by that family. And that's where innovation as well as, as foreign workers can help fill that gap. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, is there any information on where the Canadian foreign workers who do not get into Canada go to work if it is not Canada? The, the question here really is, is what percentage of the foreign worker Mexican market does Canada use? I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I have data on that. We, of course, the United States is going to be the, the bigger, far bigger employer uh, of Mexican foreign workers, both uh, legal, also living in the United States without papers as well. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have the numbers on that with regards to how do we compare to uh, other countries with regards to the employment of, of Mexican foreign workers. We're certainly going to be a uh, small fish compared to the United States. Um, but Mexican foreign workers do make up the bulk of workers in agriculture here in, in Canada, uh, followed by, by Caribbean states uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Central American states. So, of course, I, I should point out that Central American states don't participate in the seasonal agricultural worker program, but they might participate in other agricultural foreign worker programs. And uh, another question coming in here on the, um, the Mexican program. Um, do we have a sense of how supportive the Mexican government is of foreign worker program in Canada. Um, this person saying, I know we benefit from GDP. Is their government support strong as well? Uh, so the, yeah, no, so this is a good question. So the, um, the Mexican government is actually very supportive of the, of the worker program. Um, they, they do provide, uh, what, and, and when I say supportive, it's supportive in concept as well. I actually had a discussion with the Mexican consulate uh, with regards to to this program here, and, and they expressed that that um, the seasonal agriculture worker program wasn't just a, a working program, but it was also a reflection of Canada Mexico relations, which uh, might not seem that important to compared to let's say Canada U.S. relations, but it's important to point out that right now we are in a three way we were recently in a three way trade agreement process with Can with the United States and Mexico there, and and, and having certainly an ally in that area benefits Canada as well. So they, they saw that, they were actually quite proud of the program. They said we were proud to send our workers north to work there. Of course, there are bumps. Uh, very briefly, the Mexican government announced they would not be sending workers north to Canada because of, of fears related to COVID-19. Uh, they do provide some consular level support and they do sometimes show up on farms just to inspect services um, and, and conditions for workers on those farms. Um, but it is not necessarily a, a frequent thing. So moving back into GDP contribution, do we have any current estimates of GDP drop if the foreign workers are reduced or replaced by domestic Canadian workers? I don't have numbers on GDP drop, but I do have numbers on wage growth. Uh, contrary to my previous comment here on um, uh, related to uh, immigration, uh, or sorry, contrary to my previous comment here about Canadians not actually um, being in, responding to wage increases uh, related to uh, from farmers, uh, the Conference Board of Canada said that they were, if you were to compare it to a similar industry, and in this case construction, um, that that wages would have to go up by 66 percent by producers in order to hire the, the 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 gap created if we were to completely shutter the the arrival of foreign farmers, foreign workers on on farms. So that kind of gives you an idea of of the the, the the economic benefit provided to producers um, from being able to source some labor from overseas. Um, again, I, I have some, I, my, my, not a lot of questions actually about the Conference Board of Canada's numbers. I think that, that, that's absolutely correct that if we were to compare it to the similar industry that we would need to raise wages 66% to, ma to match that. But it's important to note here that conversely, is sort of what as my data has shown is that the bigger labor gap isn't necessarily from domestic employees who remain relatively static is the gaps been created by, by families leaving the industry. So I guess the question that kind of leads into this is what can be done to increase pay rates while keeping in mind we have a historical cheap food policy driven even more so by consumers making choices based on price point of food items? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there are always, a, if we look at 
there, there's going to be a number of responses here. Um, producers, again, I want to emphasize producers have been raising wages. Um, that this is something that we need to we need to make extremely clear right now. That it is a matter of producers not raising wages. Producers are waging, raising wages and actually have been since the 1940s. Um, they can certainly raise try to raise wages wages even more. And I, I think certainly right now, an historical labor shortage in in that sector, they are trying to do that right now. Um, there might also be, for example, uh, government uh, public private partnerships. They might do a wage top up system. Where the government might want might want to choose a even in particular to right now, uh, in the in COVID nineteen, where or as we begin to reopen the economy, government could say say there's a Canadian wage top up for Canadian workers in this area, and that that might be a wage top up for workers themselves, it might also be a wage top up to producers for hiring Canadians. It's another option. Um, we could also sweeten the pot for foreign workers as well, um, and and that's why I go back to the whole example of a permanent residency you might be able to attract them long term. Um, where it's not just an opportunity to come and earn Canadian money, uh, spend it in the back home in Mexico, Guatemala, or, or the Caribbean, but also maybe in the long term, uh, after a number of seasons, it might open up opportunities for them as well to come and to, uh, to live in Canada permanently. So that, that, that may be their monetary incentives, of course, uh, but also uh, immigrant, immigration incentives too. Okay, it looks like we have time for about one more question here. Um, and the question is, do you expect the need for foreign workers in Canadian agriculture to grow or reduce in the future? Is it foreseeable that technology will replace many of them? Um, I think it depends uh, on the continued transformation of the of the agricultural sector. We we still do see a, a decline in the number of small holders. These are, again, these are far, small farmers with, uh, with small outfits relying mostly on uh, family members and maybe one or two employees a year, maybe during peak season. Uh, if we continue to see them decline and we continue to see uh, growth in, in large farms uh, in Canada, uh, certainly I think we will continue to see uh, continue reliance on, on foreign workers as well. Again, I, I, I want to say reliance on foreign workers. There's no reason why they have to remain temporary. Um, we we can certainly continue to rely on seasonal workers. Uh, we could choose to make a, a certain number of them or all of them permanent residents. Um, but I think for now, uh, I, I think actually the best way to think of innovation is that innovation and well, foreign workers are actually complements to each other. There is this gap created by the exit of small fa of family farmers, and this gap is being addressed using both capital investment and foreign workers at the moment, and that they actually kind of work together right now to address that gap rather than substitute one another. If innovation gets to the extent where it eliminates even more need for workers on farms, certainly it could overtake uh, the need for, for foreign workers on farms. But as of right now, I, I think in the future going forward, we'll see continued reliance on both capital investment, innovation in the sector, as well as uh, need to rely on, on a pool of foreign workers as well. Awesome. Thank you, Robert, for sharing your insight today. And uh, thank you for everyone that tuned in. We are unfortunately out of time. It always seems to go so quick all the time, but uh, thanks for all your questions. And this will be available. So please keep an eye out on your inbox for a follow-up email. And if you haven't registered to join us on August 20th, please do. We've got an excellent panel that is going to discuss the Canadian beef supply chain. And I'm looking forward to hosting that conversation. Thanks again, everyone, and take care and have yourself a wonderful Wednesday afternoon.